This week in the parish of Bourses and Market Structure, EU Sotu Woof. There is a certain relief to discover the crass ineptitude of VDL and her merry band at the EC, but it's scary. It's not so much TTF as WTF. Nishex raises $25 million Series B round. Dublin seeks tax breaks for IPOs. And Nasdaq makes a crypto leap. My name is Patrick L. Young. Welcome to the Bourse Business Weekly Digest. It's the Exchange Invest Weekly Podcast, Episode 162. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is a very brief reduction of highlights amongst the key headlines from the week in market structure. All the analysis of the many events and happenings from the past seven days can be found in Exchange Invest's daily subscriber newsletter. The unique guide to the bourse business sent daily to your inbox. More details at exchangeinvest.com. Amongst the many things the European Union does to remind us of its own self-importance, and indeed reminds us of its broader relevance as a source of enterprise, is to mimic, badly, stuff the United States of America do rather well. Therefore, apart from Nancy Pelosi tantrums, the State of the Union address is a sound soiree, where Pottis talks and the people listen. In the Brussels version, no citizen understands why there are about 47,000 people called President and nobody listens when that blonde woman who once armed the German military with broomsticks prattles on. Anyway, last week was So Too 2022 and as nobody was watching or listening en masse, the cravenly pro-EU media have reported things badly. On the other hand, face it, who else wants to sit through this nonsense other than true believers? Once we'd waded through the hollow Ukraine support, bear in mind that roughly 70% of all military aid for Ukraine has been coming from the USA, roughly 8% from the UK, while Poland leads the EU with about 5%. Thus, the other 26 EU nations are pro rata embarrassing all Surans in aiding Kiev. Anyway, at that point, uh, VDL got into the energy crisis, and thus things further diverged from reality. Once again, demand and supply curves prove a radical economic thesis beyond the comprehension of the allegedly educated technocrats. Thus, we heard specious drivel about new benchmarks and market failures. In VDL's very own speechwriter's words, Today, our gas market has changed dramatically from pipeline gas mainly to increasing amounts of LNG. But the benchmark used in the gas market, the TTF, has not adapted. That is why the Commission will work on establishing a more representative benchmark. At the same time, we also know that energy companies are facing severe problems with liquidity and electricity futures markets, risking the functioning of our energy system. We will work with market regular blah, 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 blah. And indeed, it concludes with, so we have to decouple the dominant influence of gas on the price of electricity, at which point in time, actually, the EU are on to something here. But that's all to do with the way the electricity contracts have been written in the UK and the European Union, and nothing to do with TTF. I mean, perhaps there are issues with the absolute minutiae of pricing TTF that could require design tweaks. Although, actually, I'm not terribly convinced. But it's certainly not failing wholesale to be a big market, drawing in the key players to achieve a price consensus given the demand and supply. However, the biggest issue is that the European Union continues to hobnob with the leprechauns at the end of the rainbow and believes the fairies at the bottom of the garden think markets can be thick in order to offer them a Canutian worldview of permanent markets which always price in the way they want, aka very, very low, even when there's actually no supply about because the Russians have turned the gas pipelines off. This is, of course, the opposite of what a market is, albeit reality never particularly troubles the bureaucracy for whom six economically impossible things before breakfast always seems like an ideal approach. However, 
Rather than have me say more, perhaps I can leave it to the FT alumni. True, it was a bad week last week for the Financial Times as a whole when they were caught out with some absolute nonsense being spouted by various of the journalists. And likewise, Michael Spencer aced the point that the FT is not pro-business in a radio interview. Thus, we had actually, in the embarrassment of Javier Blas, an ex-FT commodity editor, and now a Bloomberg columnist, weighing in by tweeting, The only surprise here is that it's taken nearly a year of crazy ups and downs for the European Commission to ask the European financial regulator about circuit breakers in electricity and gas markets. Late, better than never, but oh my God, Blas continued in his tweet with a link to facing the energy crisis in the EU work streams related to the financial system by the Commission. Problem with this is, of course, well, maybe I missed something, but according to me, I could find easily enough using Uncle Google a Reuters story which said ice circuit breakers to cover energy US softs, which dated back to 2012 and from sometimes there or thereabouts, or at least during 2013, I do believe, it was automatic to add IPLs, as they're called at ICE, Interval Price Limit Circuit Breakers, in the ICE jargon, to all new futures markets. Another bad day for the FT cadre and alumni that they simply don't understand these things, and nor does the European Commission. The price limits and circuit breakers are there in a fabulously dynamic fashion so that it doesn't overly gum up the market. So anyway, TTF has all the buyers and sellers in European gas and it has dynamic and configurable price limit circuit breakers. So one might gently inquire whether this farce of the European Union and indeed what many seemingly clueless journalists are talking about. However, in a harrowing week where the FT was called out, as I mentioned, by Michael Spencer and its banking editor, or former banking editor, now deputy editor, seemed to not really understand markets at all. Thank goodness for one man who was having a coherent week at the Financial Times. Well done, Philip Stafford, exchanges correspondent and ace of much of the crypto digital coverage these days, in response to a very shouty tweet about EC President von der Leyen, The Commission will propose new gas, more representative market benchmark to move away from TTF. Phil casually replied, TTF is a benchmark that reflects the price of gas being traded on the market. Actual transactions. So how do you get something more representative? Mojist from one man at the FT. A phrase, alas... You hear about as often as EU competence these days. Anyway, well done, Phil. And in answer to various parish inquiries, I would like to add that I am not Ed. I am flattered to have been accused of being Ed, the wonderful correspondent who took down some really, really dismal FT journalism in the course of the last week. But let's face it, have I ever felt the need to criticise the Brussels Bugle or anybody else, for that matter, anonymously? Nasdaq, good week for them. They partnered with OnBrain to launch the Nasdaq Primary, an all-in-one tool that makes raising debt capital easier and more ESG conscious. They also moved into the crypto custody service in another announcement during the course of the last week, hiring Ira Auerbach to run that unit from Gemini. In Hong Kong, US inspectors arrived at PwC KPMG for the first audit review. Hopefully, therefore, US listings of Chinese stocks will manage to survive. Worries in Chicago. Chicago faces deep-seated ills in shadow of Citadel Boeing defections, went the headline in Bloomberg. Ed Tilly was trying to defend Chicago, but the problem of a high-tax, high-crime city is that after generations of mismanagement, the competitive South, as evidenced by the likes of Florida, offers sunshine and fewer shootings with zero state income tax. That's a tricky trifecta to defeat when you're Chicago and Illinois. Hence, the likes of Citadel are heading south. Chicago is a great city, but its future is looking underwhelming until it cleans up its act, curbs union entitlement, and indeed gets the horrific crime wave under control. 
Something else that's uh, being sought to be under control. The NCDEX chief in India, following on from a study that demonstrated that futures trading in commodities is not leading to price rises, he's asked for the various Indian commodity futures bans to be themselves banned and removed from circulation. Indian commodity future bans remain an impediment to free market prosperity for everyone on the subcontinent. The SEC in the US, they're proposing clearing reforms. They're going to try and centralise the clearing of the $24 trillion US Treasury bond market. Highly exciting development there. And actually one where the otherwise hyperactive but not necessarily productive Gensler regime is not so much micromanaging as actually macromanaging something that looks like a great solution. The Philippine Stock Exchange, they're targeting 20 initial public offerings during the course of 2023, having already seen their 2022 target of 11 companies looking very likely to be met. It have taken place so far, which actually equaled the 2021 total. Moreover, we had an exciting moment this week during UN Week in New York, none other than the new president of the Philippines. President Marcos was seen ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. Controversy in the UK? It's a case of scrap the cap. It's the right thing to do. There's a big issue at the moment. The banker pay cap, which was imposed, of course, as ever, by the top-down European Union. Those sorts of quasi-Marxist diktats which continue to stifle the European Union economy. Now with Brexit, the UK ought to have no truck with such nonsense if it wants to demonstrate it's recovering from the quasi-socialism of Blair, Brown, Cameron, May, Johnson. Of course, there will be those seriously com complaining about the rich getting richer, but ultimately the UK needs all the tax it can get, and there's no reason to wrap financiers in ludicrous structures which hinder economic growth as it wastes time which could be used productively and eliminates incentives to deliver more revenue. Pay related to the banker's profit, and society will progress. The LME has been involved in another legal action over their decision to cancel nickel trades. That includes the hedge fund AQR trading firm DRW Commodities, Flow Traders, Capstone Investment Advisors and David Harding's Winton Capital Management, all seeking more information, which the LME have very rapidly rebuffed, saying the disclosure request is without merit. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly. We welcome your feedback. You can contact me directly, patrick at derivativesvision.com, with any comments. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this show, we would welcome you giving us a thumbs up. Or, if you have time, a positive review will always be welcome, wherever you find this podcast. New markets this week. Well, exciting news. In Kazakhstan, they've created the committee which will look after the idea of creating the AIFC Derivative Commodity Exchange, a meeting of the project office for the launch of the Astana International Financial Centre's Derivatives Exchange has taken place and thus hopefully we'll soon see the commodity market being built. On Wall Street, Green Exchange PBC is seeking regulatory approval to operate a stock exchange that allows investors to trade equities with a demonstrated commitment to ESG. There's only one daily news source for the business of bourses, Exchange Invest, the exchange of information. Exchange Invest publishes the daily digest of everything in the market structure industry around the world in a user-friendly email briefing format from Monday to Friday. With additional pith by former Exchange CEO and long-standing fintech pioneer Patrick L. Young, yes, that's me, Exchange Invest is the unique one-stop shop for the daily news in markets, market operators and related functions. Exchange Invest is available to subscribers at $200 US per user per year or currency equivalent, You can get more details at exchangeinvest.com or email me, patrick at derivativesvision.com. Deal news this week. It was a busy week for deals in the parish. All those deals were in Exchange Invest Daily, the newsletter no person can afford to be without in capital markets and market structure. For the sake of this podcast, let's look at some edited highlights. NYSHEX, the New York shipping exchange, they've closed a $25 million Series B round to improve the reliability and efficiency of global shipping. Very exciting. They've now raised 
$69 million overall as NYSHEX seeks to lead in freight worldwide. $25 million in the latest round with no clear valuation given. However, previously the company was valued at $48.5 million prior to raising $15 million last year. One other interesting transaction, EPSOG, they've increased their stake in TSO holding the indirect operator of the Nord Pool Power Exchange. If you're looking for a means to understand the fascinating world of exchanges, fintech at all, then pick up a copy of my most recent book, Victory or Death, Blockchain, Cryptocurrency and the Fintech World. It's published by DV Books and is distributed by Ingram Worldwide. Meanwhile, while you're waiting for your copy of Victor or Death to arrive, check out our live stream. That's Tuesday, 6 p.m. London time, 1 o'clock New York time, the IPO video live show. You can catch the back episodes on LinkedIn and YouTube by searching IPO-vid. Our latest show was a fabulous episode 77 with Katerina Karamashi coming of age with ICE, discussing the job of the global head of exchange traded derivatives in the equity segment with Kat Karamashi and all about her 21 year career history with Life Now Ice Futures. Coming up on Tuesday at the same time, six o'clock London, we're going to have Kevin Brady, the CEO of the South African competitor stock market A2X. Kevin Brady, A2X, a market for all, will be live on Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube coming Tuesday at one o'clock Eastern time. Cumex news this week, well, quite a flurry. Looks as if the efforts to try and recoup money or at least gain extraditions is going well. In the UAE, while extradition moves may not have succeeded, a UAE court has ordered the Cumex suspects there to return an eye-popping $1.1 billion to Danish authorities. Similarly, there is an extradition. Anthony Patterson will be extradited from the UK, where he's been a hedge fund trader, to Denmark to face his day in court over the Cumex and extraordinary Cumex events of a number of years past. From cumulative dividends onto crypto land, Coinbase, they're highlighting politicians on their crypto friendliness and how active they've been in the crypto market via the Coinbase app. FTX's CEO, Sam Bankman-Fried, says the firm still has a billion dollars in cash left to deploy for acquisitions. How many firms in the crypto 1.0 universe can he possibly rescue? But at the same time, FTX Crypto Exchange was listed as an unauthorized company in the UK by the FCA. Exchange Invest is the daily must-read by the most influential figures operating the world's best markets. We invite you to join the exclusive group of Boris Bosses and other C-suite executives who make Exchange Invest the exchange of information, their daily business intelligence guide to markets the world over. Exchange Invest is available to subscribers at US$200 per user per year or currency equivalent. You can get more details at exchangeinvest.com or email me. Patrick at derivativesvision.com. Product news this week. The Shanghai Bourse and China Reform have teamed up to develop stock indices for state-owned enterprises that are listed. And in the Ethereum merge, quite curious, the Binance CEO, CZ, he said the drop in gas fees won't happen immediately. In which case, the whole merge is, in my humble opinion, rather useless as more modern, built from scratch and vastly cheaper blockchains will eat the lunch of the expensive Ethereum, which benefits from a crowd ignorance effect right now, but really is already looking rather dated. Not as dated as Bitcoin's blockchain, but it's definitely very Gen 1.0. In essence, though, our rentier class look to reckon they can milk Ethereum and those high fees will contribute, I do believe, in due course, largely to the downfall of Ethereum in the final reckoning. Bursa Malaysia Derivatives, they're launching enhanced gold futures on September the 19th, while the Indian Gas Exchange are seeking to launch a truck-loaded LNG contract. CME launched their events contracts, and Moscow Exchange will stop trading in British pounds on October the 3rd. Down under in Australia... 
Fex Global, they're readying a Australian Large Scale Generation Certificate, LGC, Futures and Options Contracts, which is a very, very interesting issue for the whole gamut of power, energy and emissions in the Antipodes. Technology news this week, well, quite an earth-breaking announcement from the TMX Group CEO, John McKenzie. He's planning to make Canada's capital markets great again amidst a huge amount of competition for the franchise of TMX. And at the same time, he's gone out on a limb somewhat and said blockchain technology is not robust enough for key stock exchange systems, thus contradicting the likes of well, for instance, ASX in Australia, who have been enduring a long, painful and so far utterly unsuccessful attempt to integrate digital asset holdings as the chess replacement. The announcement from TMX also rolls back their 2018 statements when the Bank of Canada and TMX had said blockchain was feasible for security settlement. Regulation news this week, SEBI in India, they've come out with a framework for the social stock exchange, and SEBON of Nepal. The regulator there have decided to distribute licenses to open stock exchanges, commodities exchanges, and brokerage firms. Interesting amount of competition coming on the stock exchange front in Nepal, potentially. And that, of course, leaves us with Big World, which, well, London cast a poll along with the UK over the world this week. At one stage, the queues appeared to have taken a life of their own. In a tribute to British values, the centre of London was queue central last weekend, with a queue to see the Queen lying in state, accompanied by a queue to get into the queue, and a queue waiting to join the queue, waiting for the queue. There were also people queuing in bars to watch the queue as it went by, and at Buckingham Palace, queues stretched across St James's Park to see the flowers left as a tribute to the Queen. On various occasions, it was impossible to get into the queue to get into Hyde Park or Green Park in order to manage to see the floral tributes that had been left there. Indeed, to get an idea of just how mega this whole event was, at 06.30 London time on the morning of Monday the 19th of September, almost five hours ahead of the funeral service at Westminster Abbey, the final visitors saw the Queen lying in state and there were some 16,000 people watching the live stream on YouTube alone. In fact, in total, that lying in state queue involved about 550 years of collective waiting amongst 400,000 people walking 4 million miles between them. That's greater than 150,000 marathons, and that's just for the one queue of the lying in state. Mourners were waiting up to 26 hours, noting with typically British candour, it's the least I can do to show their appreciation of the most famous woman of the past century. Pretty much every leader on earth was represented at the funeral during an emotional bank holiday as the beloved brilliant Queen Elizabeth was laid to rest after the ceremony at Westminster Abbey and a further ceremony, indeed a pair of ceremonies, the second being private for the family in the Windsor Castle Church. It was worth noting that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was the first monarch whose funeral service took place at Westminster Abbey since King George II in 1760 AD. That's a handy reminder of the longevity of monarchy, given the fact that the British monarchy, therefore, in that funeral alone, predated even the nation states, most of the nation states, whose representatives paid tribute on September the 19th by attending the Westminster Abbey. And thus, we could see, ladies and gentlemen, Britain is certainly not dead, now the Elizabethan era has ended. But full marks to UK Inc., to the Duke of Norfolk and the organising party of this incredible ceremonial occasion. Here's hoping that the defenestration of the blob catches fire under PM Truss and King Charles III. Long live the King. And on that mysterious and magnificent note, my name is Patrick L. Young, wishing you a great week in blockchain, life and markets. This show relates to the business of bourses.
It is not to be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any investment recommendations. Please consult an investment advisor before you make any investments, and for goodness sake, do your due diligence and do not make investments without complying with the regulations in your home state. Exchange Invest cannot be held responsible for any investment decisions made as a result of our programme, which is for entertainment purposes only. The material herein is copyright Patrick L. Young at the date of publication, while our music and sound effects are sourced from copyright-free sources. Thanks for listening to Exchange Invest Weekly, the exchange of information.